Happy week four, guys. Um, we're going to be looking at sections five and six of Antigone this week. Um, all of your questions and uh, assignments, guys, are going to be due on Friday this week, so you have all of next week as your spring break. So all of your work is due on Friday um, of this week. So you have four questions to answer this week with two sections, and um, go ahead and post your question and your response to a classmate as well. Um, so if you have your textbook, section 5 is 351 to 356, and section 6 is 359 to 364. Um, so looking over section 5, oh, let's review our questions real quick from last week. My bad. All right. So we only had section 4 last week. Um, for question 5, it says um, in lines 437 through 450, um, what are the guard's feelings about returning to speak to Creon? Why does he refer to himself as the lucky man in line 447? So at first we're probably assuming he's pretty scared to return, but it actually seems like he's pretty excited because he's bringing the King Antigone. Um, so he feels like he's kind of washed away of this guilt and he's not going to get in trouble for bringing him what he wants. So he's like saving his own life. Um, so he's actually pretty excited and he's calling himself the lucky man because he's doing that and saving his own life. Um, but in turn, he's giving up Antigone and taking away her life. Um, for question seven, um, it says in lines 508 through 518, Antigone clearly states her rationale for acting against Creon's, uh, proclamation. Um, how can you connect her reasoning to the th um, place theme so far? So, um, she basically says the gods didn't say that it's a law, so I really don't have to follow it. And then she also says that my brother deserves to be honored just like anybody else. All of my brothers deserve to be honored, not just the ones you claim to be good and the ones you claim to not be good. Um, and then kind of goes throughout the text of uh, fairness and justness. Um, that we see kind of frequently. They're always talking about is something fair, or something just, um, and if it's not, they're kind of talking about why it isn't, which we're going to see a lot more in sections five and six this week. Um, so that's kind of what I would stick with for that. For number 12, um, how and why has Ismene's um, in uh, attitude changed since the beginning of the play. So at first she was pretty scared, but now she's really willing to just step up and like share the blame with Antigone, um, which seems kind of weird. And she wants to help her now, but now when it doesn't matter as much, she wants to help. Um, so it's kind of like too little too late. Like if she would have helped out at the beginning of the play, maybe things would have turned out differently for her and Antigone. Um, but remember, right now, both of them are going to be executed according to Creon. So we're going to see how that plays out in sections 5 and 6. Um, and then 15 was the little chart. So you could have picked um, several different pieces of evidence to put for any of these. Um, so for Creon, he's kind of motivated by um, power and control. And he kind of says everything is about justice, but really he's all about that power and control and people listening to him, but he doesn't listen to anyone else. Um, Antigone is all about honor and justice. Um, she's very interested in everything being fair and equal as much as possible. Um, and Ismene just always seems scared. Scared until she's more scared to do something else. Um, so she was too scared to help um, bury her brother, but now she's even more scared that her sister is going to die, so she kind of like doesn't want to leave her sister alone. So, but she's always motivated by fear and being scared, it seems like. So, moving on to section 5 again, that starts on 351. Um, so we start with the chorus and Creon kind of talking. Um, they introduce that Haman, Creon's son, is about to come uh, into the picture. And they, they notice that he's really sad, and they're kind of like, I wonder if he's sad because he heard about Antigone. And Creon's like, well, I guess we're about to find out. Um... And so what does he kind of ask him? Of course, he's like, just caring about his power and control. Are you, you going to listen to me? Are you going to be on her side? Or are you going to be on my side? Because you really should be on my side. 
And so Haman's like, of course, I'm on your side, Dad, whatever you say, blah, blah, blah. And Creon goes into a lengthy speech where he kind of explains, he's like, first of all, good job for picking my side, because that's correct. That's the right side. Um, and he talks a little bit about fairness and being honorable, um, and how if he had useless children that didn't help him out, like, that would be bad, which... He really doesn't have good children, he doesn't have useful children. Um, Antigone buries her brother, she helps out her father, she does all these extra things. Um, she is a useful child, she does good things. Whereas um, Haman really doesn't do any of these things. Like This is one of the only times that Haman shows up in the text. Um, he only, I think, only shows up one other time and that's a pretty big entrance. So we'll kind of see that a little bit later in the text. Um, he's like, you know, you shouldn't have any false friends, you shouldn't put your faith in a woman, they don't know what they're talking about, they're bad for you to care about, which says a lot about his marriage, I'm sure, um, which we are going to meet his wife, um, in a couple of sections, so just put a pin in that. Um, he's like, I'm going to kill her, there's no changing my mind, that's how it's going to be, end of story. Um, and of course he still talks about you know, wise people, wise governing people listen to others, which of course Creon does not listen to others, so it's ironic that he says this. Um, he's like, those people are loyal and brave, um, which kind of implies that he's not loyal and brave. Um, and then he says, uh, no, we must obey whatever man the city puts in charge, whether he's good or bad, and it's like, so you're not saying that good people should be in charge, you're saying whoever's in charge should be listened to, whether it's good or bad, which is a terrible idea. Um, and then he kind of talks about lacking leadership, which he's not really leading. He's just doing whatever the heck he wants and just kind of going with that. Um, so we move on to the uh, kind of next page. Um, that's why they must support those in control, like... People who are uh, being controlled need to just do whatever they're told because otherwise they can die, such as Antigone. Um, and the chorus kind of says, okay, that I mean, that makes sense. It's reasonable. It follows logically. Then Haman kind of steps up and he's got an argument back for Creon. And he says, um, the gods instill good sense. So the gods make sure that men are logical. They make sense. They can reason. They can think. Um... But you don't really know everything, Dad, because, I mean, you're the king, you don't know everything, because people kind of watch their manners and their P's and Q's and what you know, because they don't want to get in trouble. Um, a good example of that would have been the guard. Um, so we see um, Creon uh, kind of like getting a little, hopefully a little bit of a reality check. And Haman's like, well, not everyone agrees with you, and they're actually, the citizens are really upset that you're going to kill Antigone. Um, they're, they're thinking, they're complaining, they don't think this is a good idea. And he's kind of uh, continuing with this line of thought, and he says, um, the city is upset about the girl. They think that her act was a glorious act. Um, nothing is more valuable uh, than your uh, well-being, of course, that, you know, I think, of course, that, you know, the most important thing is that you are healthy and whatnot, but your reputation is important, too, and if you do this, it's going to damage your reputation. So notice that Haman is not really focused on Antigone. He's much more focused on his father and, of course, himself. Um, so he's like, why don't you rethink this just to make sure that this is exactly the best way to handle it, um, just to, you know, Help yourself. And he's like, uh, there's nothing shameful about learning from your mistakes or being um, cautious. Um, and he's like, staying flexible is important. So listening to all the facts, taking them in, and even changing your mind is okay if you think it's a good reason to change your mind. Which is kind of what he's pointing out. Hey, maybe this isn't the right way. Especially if the citizens are not excited about what you're doing. Um, then we have... Um, a line that says, permit yourself to change. So allow yourself to change your mind um, and don't be stubborn about it. So he continues and he says, basically learn from your mistakes. And the chorus leader says, okay, you both make good points. So I think Haman's got a good point and I think Creon's got a good point. So kind of like, let's see them kind of battle it out. So...
So Creon's mad that his son doesn't just accept what he says and move forward. Um, he's like, um, they don't think she's a bad guy, Dad. You need to rethink this. And he's like, well, you're just going against me. You're too young to understand, blah, 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 which is a favorite line of parents, I'm sure you all know. Um, and then he kind of just keeps brute forcing him. He kind of just keeps pushing over like, hey, I'm the king. I do what I want. And he says, uh, I am to rule this land at someone else's whim or by myself. Like, I'm going to do me. This is my job. I'm going to do it how I see fit. And I'm not going to sit here and what everybody else wants. That's not what's, what's good about to happen. End of story. Like, it's going to be what I want, what I think is right. End of story. And they go back and forth for the next page and a half about this. Um, and he, uh, Creon does a lot of insulting to Haman. And Haman actually stays pretty level-headed for the most part until the end of the, the conversation um, on 355. Um, he's like, you're a traitor, you're a woman, you're a woman slave, you're next to nothing. Like, he just, all the bad things that Creon can think to say to his son, he does. Um, and so, at the end, he's kind of like, then she'll die and in her death, someone else, uh, kill someone else. So, if you kill her, you're basically killing me too. Like, you're just killing all of this awful stuff. Um, we're assuming it means him because, uh, Heyman says it, um... But, you never know. Tragedies mean a lot of death, guys. Keep that in mind. Um, and then uh, Creon's kind of like, so you're threatening me? And Haman's like, no, you do you. I'm just letting you know that there will be consequences if you continue with this line of reasoning and these actions. Um, and so Haman kind of is about ready to um, storm out. But before so, he's being mean. And he said, uh, or ha Haman says, you know, you will never see my face again. And of course, that's right after Creon says, well, I'm going to kill her. And I'm going to bring her right now. And I'm going to kill her right in front of you so that you can suffer even more. Um, and he's like, you're not going to kill her right in front of me. And he storm uh, Haman storms out. Um, and so the chorus leader kind of mentions like, hey, he's young. Don't be too mad at him. Like, he's, he's passionate. He loves her to some degree. And, you know, that's, that's a lot to take in. Um, so don't be mad at him. And he's like, well, these are just women. They're just girls. They're replaceable. Um, he should listen to his father, who's in power, all this kind of stuff. Um, again, focusing on that power. And then, of course, the uh, chorus is like, okay, well, how are you going to kill Antigone? Because you said you're going to, but, like, what's the game plan? So right here on 356, the last little section is where Creon describes the way that she is going to be killed. So they're actually going to stick her in a cave, alive, with a little bit of food and just a couple of supplies. And they're going to build a wall in front of the, t uh, the cave and make it a tomb. Like, she's going to be stuck in there and she's going to die in there. So she's not quite alive, and then she's not quite dead. She's in the process of dying for probably a long time, because starving to death takes quite some time, guys. Um, you can only last, like, three days without water. I think it's, like, a week or two without food. So that would be a slow, painful death for sure. Um, and that kind of moves us into Section 6, where we have actually two odes in Section 6. The first one kind of talks about the god of love. So it talks about Aphrodite's son, Eros. Um, and they talk about how men love many things. So they can love women, they can love land, they can love sailing, they can love power. But all of these things of love can lead them to really bad situations and lead them to do really crazy things. Um, which, I'm going to go ahead and let you know that's a little bit of a foreshadowing moment. I'm not going to tell you to what, but it will come up very quickly for us. Because um, we're going to start uh, looking at some of the other stuff after spring break. Um, the other sections, excuse me. Um, so we kind of get back into the plot, the thick of things. Um, the chorus sees Antigone come in, um, basically to her death, to her execution. And they feel very sad. Um, and they're, they're crying and they feel very sad for her. And they're like, 
like, uh, I don't know if this was such a great idea. Like, it was a good idea when she wasn't here, but now I can see her. She's there. It's, it's not as good of an idea as I thought it was. Um, and so Antigone kind of speaks a little bit, and she's like, well, I'm on my final journey. This is kind of like my walk to, you know, my execution. It's like the last time I can really express my thoughts and feelings. Um, she's like, I'm gonna, I'm not getting married. I'm just, I'm gonna die unmarried. I'm gonna die young. And, you know, that's a really bad feeling. Um, so the chorus, again, which is kind of the voice of the community is like, you know, we praise you. You are in charge of your own fate. Good for you. You know, you weren't sick and died. You weren't any of these other things. At least you took your, um, your ending into your own hands. Um, so Antigone continues and she's like, you know, um, comparing her death to other famous, uh, deaths of gods, goddesses, and demigods, um, and she wants to kind of mirror one of them in particular and kind of be remembered. And she wants people to remember her suffering because maybe that way it'll be fair in the future. Um, so the chorus uh, continues to kind of, you know, praise her and say how great she is. And Antigone continues, oh, you mock me. You're being so mean. You know, you don't have to do this. Like, um, I have no home, I have nowhere to go, I have no friends, I have no family, everyone's dead or not with me. Um, you don't have to mock me. And they were like, you push your daring to the limit, you know, you went too far, like, there's nothing we can do for you, but, you know, we are praising, we do mean it. Um, and Antigone continues and she's like, most painful thought, like, my father, she starts thinking about her father and her family, and remember, um, her family's already pretty whack to begin with. Remember that her father accidentally married his mother, they had children, and their four children were Antigone, Ismene, Polynices, and Eur uh, Eurydice? Eurydice? I forget how you say it, but it's the E one, the good brother. Um, but all of them are simultaneously siblings and each other's aunts and uncles and nieces and nephews so it's really complicated um they are like brother and sister and cousin it's very complicated um so she's like maybe this is me suffering because of everything that my father did and even though it was an accident the gods are still punishing him for not um doing the right thing even though he didn't know he was doing the wrong thing. Um, and so the chorus is kind of like, you know, you've been honorable, you've done good things, and hence you die because of your own selfish will. Like, you went too far. Like, we're with you, we understand that you're, you know, upset, you're suffering, and all this kind of stuff, but at the end of the day, you did break the law, and maybe it was your selfish will. If you wouldn't have done this, if you wouldn't have stuck to your values and principles, you'd still be alive. Um, and Antigone is like, no tears, no mournful friends, like, no one's gonna mourn my death. Um, it's not a sad thing, it's just, it is what it is at this point. She's kind of moving out of, like, the sad phase and kind of into the, this is what it is phase. Um, and Creon's like, um, it's irrelevant if she kills herself in this cave or if she dies in this cave from lack of food and water. I don't care. Give her the supplies for whatever she wants to do. Um, just get it done. The sooner the better. And um, the last couple of things we hear from Antigone, this last long section, she's like, oh, you know, father, please, you know, be proud of me for what I've done. Mother, please accept me. Brothers, please accept me, you know. She's talking to her dead family right before she gets executed. And she kind of reasons out that she wouldn't have done this for anybody else except her brothers. And she says this because she's like, if it was my husband, I could marry somebody else. If it was my children, I could have other children. If it was both, I could marry somebody else and have more children. But because my mother and father are dead, I can have no more brothers. He was the last one, so he deserved to be honored as the last one. Um, 
And that's kind of how she reasons it out, which seems a bit crazy to me, but that's her reasoning. She says, there's no other brothers. It's not possible for me to have any other brothers. Therefore, it is what it is. Like, I had to bury him. And her, um, her focus kind of shifts from that into, um, fairness. She's like, if this is fair, let the gods explain it to me. And if it's not, let them make it right for me, um, to make other people suffer the way I have suffered. Um, so Creon and, um, the chorus leader kind of, you know, comment on that. Um, so she's, you know, the, the chorus leader is like, her mind is just full of all these thoughts. And Creon is like, ah, eh, you know, they better do it quick because they're going to regret it if they don't, you know, move faster. They're going to have to listen to this all the way there to the cave. Um, and Antigone says, alas, then... Those words mean death in very near, are very near at hand. So she knows she's about to die. She knows she's about to get um, killed, executed, whatever happens to her. Um, and she kind of, her last thing is like to kind of praise the people for um, honor and respect, paying honor and respect um, to her. And then we have our fifth ode, which primarily focuses on um suffering gods um so it, it kind of um explains like people suffering at the hands of gods and other gods suffering because of other gods so which is kind of what antigone is going through she's being she she's not sure if she's suffering because of gods or you know at least people in power um but it does talk about that suffering especially in the last um antistrophe two it says um in their misery they wept, lamenting their wretched suffering, sons of a mother whose marriage had gone wrong. So this is kind of mirroring what happened to her. So her mother's marriage had gone wrong, and everybody was suffering in this example, just the same as Antigone has been suffering. Um, and she kind of leaves it up to the fates, which the three fates we've talked about, they're the ones in the Disney Hercules. Um, and so that is it for... Um, five and six, we're going to go ahead and look at question, uh, questions five and six on page 365, and then questions eight and nine on 366. Um, please let me know if you have any additional questions, guys. Um, we are supposed to be continuing with um, online stuff after spring break. Um, I haven't put anything together for that yet, um, but I will be getting that out to you guys. Um, at the beginning of, not next week, but the week after, so the week after spring break. Um, so around the 20th, give or take. Um, please let me know if you have any questions, guys. I'm here, um, as I always am. Um, make sure that if you're not posting, if you're not communicating with me, you do so, because it's important. And if you're not continuously turning in your work, if you're not communicating with me, um, we got the problem and you go on a naughty list where you get like several phone calls from me and several phone calls from other people. So, um, if you don't want us calling your people, talk to me. Um, have a good day, guys. Make sure you get this work in by Friday, this Friday, which is what, the 10th, I think? Let me check. Yes, the 10th. So get this in by the 10th so that I can give you that full week off, all right? Full week, no check-ins, just a break, all right? Be good, guys. Or try to.